right, let me start with a question. What is web scraping? You don't have to answer, just think about it for a few seconds. <laughs> All right, got it. The art of opening a website. Uh, it's a bit of a trick question, right? I assume most of you thought about something like extracting data from the internet or from the web. And yeah, you were absolutely correct. That is the end goal of web scraping. But what I want to show you today is that the most interesting or hard or engineering-like part is actually opening the websites, the websites that are trying to protect from being opened and from being scraped. So I'm Ondra Urban. I work at Epify. Epify is a web scrape and automation platform, which means that we scrape for a living. We do it every day, and we kind of know a few things about it. I lead a team of engineers. We build a lot of tools to make it easier. And I'll try to guide you through some of those tools that you can use also, because they're open source. Uh, we will be scraping foobar.com. Actually, the website exists, but this one is not real. I just needed to come up with some made-up website. It is based on a real one, but I didn't want this to be a guide how to scrape a specific website. It's mostly a set of tools that you can use to scrape any kind of website. So it's not about foobar. This is just a placeholder. How would we scrape it, right? I mean, just curl it. We had a great talk about curl. Uh, this should work. I mean, probably. No. <laughs> uh, error code 1009. What does it mean? That's not even an HTTP response, right? Well, actually, if you open the page in the browser, you will see this. Some of you might know it. But it basically says that, hey, you cannot access our website from the location you're in. You know, from Czech Republic, no way. So is there something we can do about this? Yeah, sure. We can use a proxy server, right? For those of you who don't know what a proxy server is, it's just a service that makes you anonymous on the web. It makes it look like, to the website, as if you were coming from a different place or from a different, a different IP address. That's a pretty standard tool for scraping. So is it going to help us? We can use our Epify proxy. We set the country to the United States because foobar.com is from the United States. It's just a simple curl again. And let's see. No. Just a different error, different code. This time, I'm sorry, but your IP address is banned. And it's not only the IP address, but the whole ASN, which means thousands or hundreds of thousands of IP addresses. It could be a provider, it could be the whole IP range, but a data center proxy, which is a proxy from, which lives in a data center, is not going to help us here. We just can't get through this, through this error. What can we do? Well, we can use a residential proxy. A residential proxy is a special kind of proxy which does not live in a data center, but at somebody's home. And it could be a mobile phone, a laptop, it could be a desktop computer, but really any kind of device that can run a proxy server. And it's not a botnet. This is completely legal. Some people just opt in to use their home devices as a node in the proxy network. And then our requests can be proxied through their cell phones. It's either for money or you want to use an app without ads. And you can choose, hey, do you want ads or do you want uh, to provide your device as a node in the proxy network? The great thing about residential proxies is they are almost undetectable, because anybody can be a residential proxy. So we just add another command, which uses a residential proxy to our curl, try it out. Yeah, that's it, nothing. No error, nothing. This is what I got, like, literally. Uh, I was like, OK, well, this is about the end of curl, because I have no other idea. Let's try something else. Well, what, what should we try? The point is. Websites don't really like bots, you know? They don't want bots to be accessing the websites. They want humans to be accessing the websites. So if you want your bot to access a website, it needs to look like a human. Well, what does it mean? It means that it needs to look like if a human was making that HTTP request. What do, what do humans use? Browsers, right? If you have a browser and you click, the requests look in a certain way. If you look at how a request looks when you're using curl, it's pretty much like saying, hey, I'm a bot. You know, this, this is not what a normal person would do to access a website. What you need is this. Yeah, those are the headers of a browser. And you need a lot of them. Because if you want to scrape 10 million pages, you can't look like one user. 
you need to look like 10,000 users. So you can't be manually writing this down from, a, from your browser, from DevTools, keeping it somewhere. You need an automated system to do this. So this is why we asked Darth Vader to do it for us. <laughs> this is not a joke. This is actual website on our domain, knitting.epify.com. And the purpose of it is to collect headers from the real world. Obviously, we anonymize those headers. We remove all the IPs, all cookies, everything, because we're not really interested in somebody's private data. We're just interested in how real world headers look like. And we can have automated changes, because whenever a new version of a browser comes out, it will immediately show up in the headers we collect. Then, you know, this is a huge data set of headers, and it's not very practical. So we built this library called Header Generator, which takes the huge amount of headers and builds a statistical model that can then generate those real-world headers without actually using the real-world headers. And you can choose if you want a desktop computer, mobile, which version of a browser, and it will output the correct headers for you. So does that mean that we are browser-like? Does it mean that we are a human? Yeah, we're not. <laughs> uh, there are many more things that you need to figure out before you look like a browser. First of all, HTTP2. Uh, HTTP2 is now used in all browsers, so if you use HTTP1, you're basically flagging yourself as a bot. TLS versions, ciphers, signature algorithms. There's a lot of things that a browser uses that normal HTTP clients in Python, JavaScript, or any kind of language use that you need to mimic. So, again, we decided to build a library that will do this for us. We call it God Scraping, because God is one of the most popular HTTP clients for Node.js. We tried to open FUBAR with it. No. Still not, it doesn't work. Uh, Cloudflare is a very popular DDoS protection. You might know it. The page looks like this. Well, whenever a browser opens up for you and says, dot, dot, please wait, check in your browser, that's Cloudflare. Obviously, when you're using an HTTP client and you can't execute JavaScript, you can't do anything, right? Because it just does not do. It will stay like this forever. So what's the point? Yeah, well, you can use a real browser. That should fix it, finally. So we can use Appify, which is our library, which makes it easier to use browsers for scraping. But you could use Puppeteer, Playwright, Selenium, any kind of those libraries. And let's try to open the website with the browser. Still nothing. You know, now we at least executed the JavaScript, but because we executed the JavaScript, they now know that we are a bot. So they give us a captcha. We can't do anything about this. I mean, some captchas can be broken, but not this one. So what do we do? We need to not get the captcha, which means we don't need to break the captcha, we need to break the detection which shows us the capture. Well, how are we going to do it? How did they find out? Well, they found out because we had a wrong fingerprint. A fingerprint is a set of information that the website can gather about your browser and your operating system and how you use it. It can tell you if you have a microphone, do you have a webcam, what's the screen resolution, and so on. And if this does not match a real-world machine that users use, it will flag you like, oh, you know, this is not cool. This guy is using an M1 Mac with one gigabyte of RAM. This does not exist. But the biggest problem is that when you start using those scraping libraries or those automation libraries, they will even flag you like the curl does. You know, see, headless Chrome in the user agent that basically says, I'm a bot again. So there's a lot of things you need to fix first. Yeah, you need to have a correct user agent. You need to look like a computer that actually exists. You need to do a lot of things. And obviously, you need to get this information somewhere. So Vader helps us again. We collect those fingerprints, anonymize them, then put them in a statistical model, and we can generate fingerprints for any kind of browser, for any operating system, and so on. This enables us to actually get through and look like a real user. But before, we can use it, we actually need to inject it somehow. Because, again, it's not as simple as just adding something to the browser. Obviously, the protections that are good at preventing you from accessing the website as a bot, they will try to figure out if you added a fingerprint. So 
you need to also clean up after yourself. It cannot be done in a way that you just add it in. You also have to figure out how to clean up stack traces from the functions that you called that would input the uh, fingerprints and so on. But finally, after all this, yeah, we finally will open foobar.com and we can extract data. Uh, do you think it's going to be difficult? So this is some jQuery code, uh, which is not real, but doesn't matter. You, you run it, that's it. Really, like extracting data is now the smallest part of web scraping. The easiest, the most uninteresting maybe. It's really about everything before that that you need to do to even get to the website, to be able to open the website 10,000 times, a million times, 10 million times. The extracting data is just the cherry on the top. So that's why I kind of made this first impression about the art of opening a website. But I wanted to talk about some real examples because this was, this was all a bit theoretical. So we have a client. Their name is Truebill. And it's a fintech startup. One of their core features where they are trying to help people save money is that they will scan your account or your bank account and they will find subscriptions of various services that you have. And they will tell you, hey, you can unsubscribe Netflix, you can unsubscribe Disney and whatnot, and you will save $100 a month. This is cool. And you can do it automatically. You just click a button, give us the credentials, and everything will happen. You don't need to do anything. Well, this is when Appify comes in. Because we have robots, we call them actors, that are called via API from Truebill, and then run through the unsubscription flow for all these websites automatically. So the robot actually opens Netflix, logs in with the credentials, uh, goes through the unsubscription flows like account, settings, billing, cancel. Yes, really cancel. I'm sure I want to cancel. Yeah. And uh, this, is also, this is all done automatically. But login flows are one of the most difficult to crack because it's not only opening some eShop. E -shop. No, it's really something that could do a lot of harm if a bot could log in uh, into somebody's account. And our credentials are valid. I mean, we get them from the users. It's totally cool to do this. But there's a lot of cases where it's not cool when somebody steals credentials. It's called credential stuffing. You should not be able to do this easily. So login pages are super, super protected from scraping and from automation. And having the correct fingerprints and going through all this that I just showed you is absolutely needed to even be able to do a use case like this, to automatically cancel subscriptions for someone. Another client we have is Thorn. Thorn is an American foundation started by Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore. And what they do is they try to combat sex trafficking, uh, basically kidnapping and stealing children to being sex trafficked, and they try to do it with technology. What we do for them is we scrape terabytes of data of videos and photos from porn sites, escort sites all over the US. And they then take pictures or photos of the kids, run it through some AI with the data that we give them, with the videos and pictures, and they try to find the kids by kind of identifying them in the huge amount of data that we give them. And what's super interesting is that they were able to identify and find 17,000 children. And it's in only about five or four years or something. It's crazy, and it's only in the US. The question is, how many are there that were not found? Like 17,000 is such a huge number. We're super proud of this use case. It's kind of, it gives purpose to scraping, you know? It's not this shady thing that you talk about. It's like you're saving lives with this. This is super cool. Uh, we obviously have many more clients, uh, but it's not important who they are. I just wanted to show that Scraping is really becoming a normal business, you know. It's not like this shady thing, this niche thing that somebody does in their garage. It's a very legitimate way of extracting data from the internet and using them for your business purposes or creating new products. Because some products just cannot be built without a lot of data from the internet. And this gives you the power, even if you're not Google, to actually get this data. Uh, some numbers about Epify, so you kind of can imagine what the scale is, but we download 1.3 billion pages every month. So our platform is pretty big. 
and we process a thousand terabytes of data every month. So it's, again, it's not, it's not a garage business. It's, it's a platform that runs a lot of code. Everybody can run code on it, and it's, it's pretty powerful, and it's interesting to see how web scraping is moving from being something that almost nobody talks about to a real use case for Fortune 500 companies. I'd like to finish with some tips that you can use uh, anytime you scrape, if you want to scrape more than 100 pages. Uh, always try to look for APIs, because if you're front-end devs or if you're any devs, you know that when you open the network tab, you'll see a lot of communication between the web page on your computer and their servers. Nowadays, you don't really have to extract that much data from HTML. You can just use the API calls to get the data, already structured. It's much faster, cheaper, it does not put so much pressure on the website. So if you can find this, definitely use it, always. You should block unwanted traffic, because again, it's let, it reduces stress, costs you less money, because you don't have to do all this communication. And maybe even more importantly, if you want to use residential proxies, which are billed uh, by gigabyte, you really don't want to download those ads, images, style sheets, whatnot. You just want the data, so focus on the data. Reusing sessions. This means that you can do this small hack because a website will typically allow a browser in, right? So you'll have this browser with your fingerprints, it's super cool, open the website, the website sends you some cookies, some token, some information, and you can then take this and use it in your HTTP client without using the browser. And most of the time it works. Sometimes it works for two requests, sometimes it works for 100 requests, but the websites often don't check again whether you're a bot after they authenticated you. So it's not like something that will help you always, but it can save you costs because instead of making 100 requests through a browser, you can only do 10 and the other 90 through an HTTP client, which is much cheaper. Finally, you should always scrape ethically. It's a weird concept, but when we scrape, we always try to think about the website that we're scraping. Are we doing some harm to the website? No, because it's different when you scrape 10 million pages from Amazon, which doesn't even know that you're doing it, or if you scrape a million pages from a website that only has 1,000 visitors monthly. Yeah, you, you need to check this, and you need to be sure what you're doing and what you're scraping, and if it's okay to scrape that. Like, scraping millions of profiles from Facebook, not okay. Yeah, it's even illegal. But there are ways to scrape ethically, and you should think about it when you're doing it. Some resources, because everything I showed you uh, is open source. So you can use it in your own projects. You can try it out. Uh, Especially, most of the libraries are by Appify, Puppeteer and Playwright. Puppeteer is by Google, Playwright is by Microsoft. A funny thing is that Puppeteer was first, and then Microsoft decided they want a library as well, so they kind of took all the developers from Google, and they started Playwright with them. And that's it. I hope it helped. Thank you for listening. I have not even been so much time. <laughs>